I'm going to talk about orthopedic surgery and cerebral palsy. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys with a different, there's maybe one little bit of a gory picture, but uh, the rest of it is, is nice and above board. So, and I'm sure you guys have talked about um, uh, uh, all the things, but orthopedic surgery plays an important role in the management of a CP child. And my main aim is to try to optimize function and to prevent deformity. Now, you've talked about all of these things that CP is a static encephalopathy, but it's associated with a progressive musculoskeletal pathology. Now, this leads to a, a discrepancy between the muscle and the bone growth, and that leads to deformities of these, the bones and the, and the joints with loss of function, pain, and difficulty in care. Now, me as an orthopedic surgeon plays a crucial role, but as part of a multidisciplinary team. And if there's one thing that I can um, tell you guys about a bit more today, is about hip surveillance. And I think that's where my role as an orthopedic surgeon is very, very important. Now, the types of impairment is the primary impairment, and I'm sure you guys have talked a lot about this. And this is what the permanent and, um, and due to the direct effect of the, of the brain lesion. And you've got positive and negative ones. I'm not going to go into too much um, detail about that. But we know that the negative ones are such as weakness, uh, fatigability, loss of selective muscle control. And these are the ones that's more harmful and disabling for our patients. Now, the secondary impairment, which is after the effect of the primary one, that's where me, me as an orthopedic surgeon, can, can try to make a difference for these children. Um, we know that spasticity results in muscles with shorter and fewer fibers with a longer tendon, and this leads to diminished excursion, secondary to decreased cross-section, and that leads to decreased um, a range of movement of the joints. Now, a normal child, I always say, a child's job is to play. He must go and run outside. And now our CPs can't do that, and they need that stimulation for their muscles to grow. And that's why we get these... Due to the spasticity, we, we get the decreased range of, of motion in our, in our joints. Now, I won't bore you also now with, with physics, um, but what it just boils down to, another thing that we always have a look at is your lever on dysfunction. Now, what it, um, moment is the force time, times distance, but your lever arm, I just want to see, is there a pointer? Um, oh, let's go back. Um, the pointer is... What it basically boils down to, if you look in the, on the, pro, uh, the, the picture of the foot, if you've got a nice flat foot, you've got a long lever arm, which is beneficial to the child. If the child has got a leg that's an external rotation, you're actually making this lever arm shorter, and you're making it more difficult for the child. The same as if he's in an equinus position, walking on his toes, indirectly, you're making the lever arm shorter, making it more difficult for the child. So then we've also got the tertiary impairments, which is adaptive mechanisms and coping responses to the primary and secondary ones. And that's things like the spasticity that the child's got in his psoas and his adductors and how he circumducts when he walks. So you have to be very careful not to always go and address those things because you can actually make the child worse by doing it. Now, timing of our orthopedic surgery, the literature is, is, is not clear, um, but... I think it's very important that everybody must see that orthopedic surgery is part of the long-term management of these children. And it should be anticipated and well-planned. And it shouldn't be seen as just a last resort. We can't do anything more for the child. Let's send him to the orthopedic surgeon. He's going he's to try to sort him out. And our timing of the surgery is determined by our maturation of our central nervous system, the ambulation potential of this child, and the rate of the contracture that's happening, as well as your lever arm dysfunction that's going to happen. Now, I feel presence of, of significant hip displacement um, should worry us or, or prompt us to maybe to try to do something for this child as soon as possible. Now, we know that, that the decrease of recurrence from an orthopedic point of view is better if you actually delay the surgery up to about the, the age of seven to nine. We know the child actually only starts maturing his own gait pattern at the age of seven. But there is definitely literature that says maybe to try to, to, to operate them a little bit earlier, between the ages of four to six. Now, I always say that 
for a child to be operated on, you need this whole multidisciplinary team. You need the physiotherapist, the OTs. And a lot of times in South Africa, our children don't have that at the age of, of, of four or five years age. We've now just heard what Advocate Nelson said. Some of these cases go on for 17 years before the child actually then gets money to have these things. I just want to reiterate that. I'm working in the government hospital, and uh, we, I do all these things in the government setup as well. So there is always, for, even for these children, that doesn't have these money that was, that, were, that was paid out. I can always help them. So please bring them to me. I'll try my best to help these children. Um, then, um, when I was a, a registrar, I worked under Professor Ruli Grave. Now, he was seen as one of the fathers of cerebral palsy in, in South Africa. And um, that was the older way of thinking with, with the surgery of, of, of CPs, that they, they did the one thing, they operated the hamstrings, and then we'll see what will be the effect on the, he, the hips or the feet. And nowadays we do what we call SEMLs, of single event multi-level surgery. And I feel that is the standard of care nowadays. So what that means is you operate multiple levels at the same time. Um, now, this reduces the repeated anesthetics for these children, and as well as decrease the episodes of hospitalization. Now, a guy called Mercer Rang called this the birthday syndrome, because for this child, for every birthday, he needs to go back to theater, and we try to, to, to prevent that. Also, we know if a child had a, a semels, the rehabilitation is, is, is more difficult, um, so it's more work for the physiotherapist, the OTs, um, all these people, but it's just one episode, hopefully, and that will make their life a little bit easier as well. So I feel we should always look, keep our goals, and what do we, want to, what do we try to do for these children, hype in our agenda. Now, unfortunately, it depends on the severity, the functional impairment, um, our GMFCS um, levels of the, of the children, but also the goals of the child, as well as the family and the rest of the multidisciplinary team. What do they expect um, what we're going to do with the surgery? Usually in the first decade, our aim is to improve function for the child. In the second decade, we try to improve their appearance. And then in the third decade and later on in life, we just want to actually try to avoid pain for these children or, or patients. So our general goals is we're going to try to reduce spasticity in a selective manner. Now, I'm going to talk about, just later, about <coughs> muscular tenderness lengthenings. Um, what that just means is, it used to be that we, we operated on the tendon of the muscle, so we lengthened the tendon, we did a Z lengthening of the tendon, but nowadays, we do more what we call a muscular tenderness or a fractional lengthening. So we, I'm going to show a picture of it, but that actually decreases the spasticity in the muscle. And the reason for that is, uh, well, I'll show you guys just now. Um, so we could try to correct the contractures that hinder function or interfere with the hygiene, and we correct these lever arm dysfunction that I, that I just talked about. But remember, surgery usually cannot directly address problems with balance or selective motor control and insufficient strength. So if the child doesn't have the muscle power in his quads to keep him up, I can't make, give him that muscle power always to try to get him up. Now, our goals for the GMFC 1s and uh, 1 to 3, so our, our ambulatory CPs, is to try to optimize gait um, efficiency and to try to optimize our energy conservation. So we're doing this by preserving and improve the physical function, try pain relief and pain prevention, and increase the endurance and the activities. Our other goal is to try to improve the appearance of gait and the appearance of the child. So we try to reduce the reliance of walking aids and orthotics. I always say every child has the right to a plantigrade foot, even if it's a child in a wheelchair. The reason for that is well, he still sits in a, in a wheelchair, but we can just put a shoe on this child's foot instead of just wearing socks. Um, and and, and I, f I feel very strongly about that, that we need to try to make these children acceptable in the society as well. Um, I always say we try to let them stand and walk taller. A child that's, that's taller can look the world in the, in, in, in the eyes, and I feel that that, that makes him 
um, feel a little bit better as well. Now for our non-ambulatory CPs, I think we need to make a, a very big decision to remember that not all CPs with a GMFCS5 is going to be walkers. And I think you must always keep in mind, am I going to put this child through all this massive amount of pain, this massive amount of re rehabilitation, to try to get him to walk, and eventually he's not going to fail. And it's going to fail. I've got lots of patients who is now 18, 19 years of age, who sits in wheelchairs with straight legs, straight hips, and arms like this. Now, did we do this child a favor by operating him through his life? I don't think so. So, but our goals for these, for these children are to try to relieve and prevent pain and discomfort, to facilitate ease of care, and that is also trying to, if, they, if they, there is the possibility for them to be able to transfer, let's try to go for it. I'm not saying not, don't operate them, but if this child doesn't have it, why do we want to put him through all this, this pain? And that's where, to preserve and improve the health of the child, and also to actually then improve the quality of the child's life. Now, the surgeries that I do, um, I do release of uh, muscular tenderness units, and we're going to show you a picture of that. I do tendon transfers for the, for the lawyers. What that means is I take the one muscle from the one side of the foot or one part of the body, and I move it to the other side so that that muscle actually then takes over the function of the one that's not working. I do osteotomies. Now, that means I cut through the bone, and I move it, and I turn it, or I lengthen it, or shorten it, and, and able to try to make it better. Arthrodesis, um, we sometimes go and we fuse a joint so that the joint doesn't move. So I put it in a better position, and I fuse it in that position. Or I don't, I, I don't do arthroplasty for the cerebral palsy children, but there are people who, who do arthroplasties for them. But I think that's also in a very specific selective um, patient that you should be doing those things. Now, I always say cerebral palsy is a, is a disease that affects muscle that crosses more than one joint. So we call it the multi-articular muscles. So these are the, our muscles like our psoas, our rectus, our hamstrings, our gastrox. Remember hamstrings? From your ischial tuberosity, it crosses the hip joint, it crosses the knee joint, and inserts on your, on your tibia. Um, the gastrox and the posterior aspect of the femur crosses the knee, crosses the ankle joint, so it crosses two joints. And we know that these are usually the muscles that's, that's affected. So I think if you want to try to do surgery, try to address these muscles, and not what we call the, the, the monoarticular muscles. And, it's be, and the reason for that is because we want to try to preserve our anti-gravity function and also to try to prevent the loss of, of stability in our post-op period. And that's what's going to happen if you, happen if you operate on these muscles. Now, hip dysplasia or hip displacement. So we know for our, our gross motor function scales type 1, which is an extra on the left-hand side, those look like pretty normal hips. They're beautiful hips, and we know usually with our GMFCSs, the hip dysplasia can be up to 0%. So not all children will have a hip problem later on in life. The extra on, the, on, the, on your right is actually a child that I operated yesterday, uh, which is a gross motor function scale 5. And um, what you can see is on the right-hand side, that hip is completely dislocated. So, um, and we know for those ones, for, the, for the, our worst affected children, the, the displacement can, or dysplasia can be up to 90% for them. Now, all children are born with hips that's in a little bit of coxa vulga. That's why I've got this picture. I just don't know which one is the pointer. Um, the tip, this one. Sorry. Um, I just want to, if possible, to show them. Oh, don't worry. Sorry. Don't worry. On the, on the, the hip, on the, on, as you said, on the right-hand side, can you see that the neck shaft angle is higher? So the hip is in coxa, what we call coxa vulga. They're usually born with antiversion, so the hip is looking more forward. So all children are born with that. But as they start running and playing, those hips actually move down, and they, and they move backwards as well. Now, with our cerebral palsy children, because of the muscle imbalance, this doesn't happen. And the fact that they don't run outside, this doesn't happen. And, um, and then the, the, um, the spasticity of the flexors 
um, the hip flexors and the hamstrings actually then puts the hip into an adducted and flexed position. And then what's going to happen is your hip is slowly going to dislocate outwards. Now these are the x-rays of the same patient. Um, where on the left hand side you can see those are pretty normal. Bye donkey. Bye donkey prof. <laughs> the x-ray on the, on the left hand side you can see those are pretty normal, normal hips. And as the time goes on you can see that the hips are actually migrating, ending up with a, a dislocated hip on both sides. Um, so, an untreated hip dislocation in 50% of children is symptomatic. So, I had a long chat with uh, uh, Professor Faiki de Toy two, three weekends ago, um, who's also a, a, a pediatric guy. Um, and he also says, he doesn't always operate, if the hip is out, he doesn't always go and put them back because only 50% of them gets, um, gets symptomatic. And uh, so if it's symptomatic, then we will go and do something for them. But what I want to say is try to prevent the hip from dislocating. Now, usually children with bilateral involvement have, um, can have asymmetric deformities. And I'm going to show you a picture of the Reimer's Migration Index. And this is what you can use to look at which of the hips that's um, at risk. And we're going to show you now. There's actually nowadays, there's apps available. The, the one at the bottom is hip screen. It's actually got like a little camera thing where you put over the x-ray and it shows you which hips um, are at risk or not. So, and as I say there, it's 100% free to download on, uh, on the, from the iStore. So what the Reimer's Migration Index is, is what it actually do is it does, it, it looks of the amount of the head, that <coughs> distance A, that is outside of the acetabulum, and take that as an as a, as a index on the total width of the head. So that means if we know that 30% or less of the head is, is, is sticking outside, so most of the head is inside the acetabulum, we know that that hip is relatively fine. It's when this distance A becomes uh, increased that that hip is slowly starting to to migrate outwards so screening an surgical early surgical intervention um, can help um, first of all those 50 percent of, of of patients that's symptomatic to to become symptomatic and it's also it's usually a smaller procedure when the child is younger than it is when the child is older so indications for primary hip surveillance in general for children I feel if there's any history of spasticity, you need to go and think about these things. If there's a delayed walking or inability to walk by the age of 30 months, if there's reduced hip abduction, um, as well as, or if there's any concern of any healthcare professional regarding the hips, I feel every child should have a hip x-ray. Now, this is in a, a recent meta-analysis. There's, there's, there's multiple uh, protocols about hip screening, but I think this is a very nice hip screening um, protocol to follow. So I always say every child must have an x-ray of his hips sometime in his life. Always. And we see that for the GMFC 1s and 2s, um, with usually one x-ray is, is sufficient between the age of 2 and 8. But those are the ones that have got good hips, that the hips are not in, at risk. As soon as you've got a migration index of more than 30 degrees, you need to be more vigilant regarding these children. So you need to x-ray them more often. So then they need annual radiographs until the age of, of eight, and then even when they're older, until skeletal maturity, every two years to make sure what's happening with this hip. If a hip migration index increases by more than 7%, you really, really need to think of doing something for this, for this child's hip. Now, the surgery that I can do is soft tissue, where I just operate on the muscles. I can lengthen muscles and release muscles. Or I can do bony procedures, where I do a varus osteotomy, where, I, where the femur is looking up like this. I cut it through and I bend it down so it can point more in towards the, into the acetabulum. I can operate the, the, the pelvis as well. Or I can do palliative op operations, where I do a valgus osteotomy. That was the child that I showed the x-ray of, of that I operated on yesterday. I did a palliative valgus osteotomy for that child. Um, so, because, but remember, 
a complete hip reconstruction is a major event for these already very vulnerable patients of ours. And it's a painful, with a long rehab, and with high risk of complications. And we're going to start talking about those just now as well. Regarding lower limb surgery, my goal for these children is to try to have an extended, straight, but flexible knee that he can still bend, with a plantigrade, braceable foot if he needs to wear orth orthosis, and to, give him, to try to give him a stable base of support for standing and for his gait, and also to try to, to address those um, lever arm dysfunctions. Now, the knee surgery, multiple things. I can do muscle lengthenings. I can, I personally feel nowadays that distal hamstring lengthenings are better than a proximal hamstring lengthening. And I think you should think very clear, nicely before you release your lateral hamstrings because we know then they've got a high, higher risk of, of genure curvatum. And I feel your, your, your biceps also plays a major, major role in your stability of your knee and proprioception. So I, 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 I always say, I teach my registrars, we only do medial hamstring releases. Very rarely I'll do something on the lateral side. Um, transfer of the distal hamstrings has actually fallen out of favor a little bit. Um, and then otherwise, nowadays, extension osteotomy. So that means I take the distal femur, I cut an anterior wedge out, and I make the leg straight and I fix it with a plate. That way I can actually try to get the leg in a, in a better position. Distal guided growth is where I take a little staple or a little plate and I put it over the anterior part of the growth plate of the distal femur. So the front part is not growing, but the, the, the posterior part is growing, and that just makes then the, the leg straight. The problem with that is it takes years for the leg to get straight. So it's still one of those things that we, we don't know about um, for, for knee flexion, but definitely I use it in different other places as well. So this is the little gory picture. So anyone who's squeamish, maybe just look away. So what I do is I use a medial approach. So that's the, dis the, the tibia. This is the femur. I use a medial approach. These are my hamstrings. That's gracilis. That's semi-membranosis. Uh, that's semi-tendinosis. So what I do is I just cut through the aponeurosis, the white part. So I leave the muscle actually intact. The same I did with the, with the gracilis there. So what do we actually cause? Is I actually cause muscle tears for these children. So the muscle actually stays intact. And uh, I feel that your risk of over-lengthening a muscle like this is far less than when we do the old way of, of doing um, Z-lengthenings. Our concerns with hamstrings is, as we know, is you can cause an anterior pelvic tilt for these children with loss of hip extension, but usually those are, are, are mild. Um, so as I say, if you do these kind of lengthenings, I feel that the, the, the risk of over-lengthening the muscle is far less. Regarding the ankle and the foot, um, the most common deformities that we see is the equinus, which is this one here, walking on the toes, a plano valgus and a cavo varus, but we'll go into all of these just now. So when I always look at a deformity in a foot, I want to know, is it due to a dynamic overactivity or in a muscle imbalance? And that's where pharmacological and Botox and all those things can come in. I'm not going to talk about Botox. I feel that's almost more a, a medical treatment of the, of the child, and it doesn't fall in part of this, of this talk. If you have a fixed deformity, my opinion is Botox is not going to work. You need to go and lengthen the muscle to try to correct your lever arm dysfunction to try to get the foot into a, or the, the limb into a better position. Um, then if there is structural malalignment, usually then I have to, put, to do bony procedures as well. Now for these little children walking on their toes, I, th I feel I have to go and release those muscles if there's a significant contracture, as you can see on this child. Always if there's a, a midfoot break or the child cannot wear um, orthosis anymore. And I do a percutaneous Achilles tendon lengthening nowadays. I don't do an open procedure anymore. I can't remember the last time I did one. Um, and the reason is because I follow the same principles. The chance that I'm going to over-lengthen an Achilles tendon is far less by doing that. And I will rather have to take the child back to theater for an Achilles tendon lengthening as to try to go and correct the over-lengthened Achilles tendon because you can't fix those. So now a plano valgus foot or a cueno plano valgus foot, we know we see a lot of our cerebral palsy children with these kind of feet. But you can see that the 
the calcaneus is moving more towards the, the lateral side. That bump there, that's the talus. The navicular moves to the, to, the left and, uh, to the lateral side. And for these children, it's actually painful to walk. So for these ones, I feel if they've got a, a foot in a plane of valgus, sometimes I have to combine uh, soft tissue with bony procedures to try to, to get that better. Um, another deformities we see is what we call the ankle valgus, and that's where I, I feel that hemiepiphysiodesis or growth plate um, surgery makes a, makes a difference. So you can see on this side, I stop the growth on that side. That part still grows, and you actually correct the, the, the ankle deformity. Um, other thing that we see a lot of is cerebral palsy children with bunions. Um, my opinion is that soft tissue procedures doesn't work. Osteotomies don't work for them, and they need to get a, a, actually an arthrodesis of that, of that MP joint. We also see a lot of our, our cerebral palsy children that walks with, with squinting patellae. The leg is an internal rotation and adducted, the patella facing, facing inwards. Now, what happened there with those children is they've got what I said earlier about they've got, still got increased femoral antiversion. So their femurs, if you look at this, on this picture the, over here, this is a normal femur with a head, normally it's about 15 degrees that it's pointed forward. Can you see that this one, the, the head is looking forward quite substantially more. So for this child to be able to keep his hip in his acetabulum, he has to internally rotate his leg. And remember, I've not, and sometimes they have to externally rotate it. But by doing this, remember the picture of the lever arm dysfunction? I'm shortening his lever arm dysfunction. So it's making it more difficult for these children to walk. So for these ones, I do a proximal femoral derotation osteotomy. Well, I like the, the, the proximal one. It's because I can usually also incorporate some various to try to get that hip deeper into the acetabulum um, with that. But you can also do a derotation distally. If you have to now have a child who's got a, a fixed knee flexion contracture, and I want to do an extension osteotomy of the femur, I can do my derotation on that side as well. So with the tibia, the same thing. They can usually either be turned inwards or outwards. And I, there I do my osteotomies at the bottom of the ones. Now, upper limb surgery, um, when I was a registrar, Prof. Graber, I don't think he ever, ever asked me to examine an upper limb in a cerebral palsy child because it was always just the lower limb that was the, that was the important thing. And, um, but nowadays... We, we, we tend to operate more of the, of the upper limbs. And what we want to try to do is we want to try to improve the grasp and release between the wrist and the digits. The hand appearance. I've got a beautiful little girl, um, a patient of mine. She came in with, uh, when she was about 13, 14 years of age, with a severe wrist flexion um, deformity. It was a fixed one. And she told me all she wants is just to be able to push uh, hand through a school jersey just to, and let the arm just looks a little bit more, more normal. So for that child, they did a wrist arthrodesis and Amber is a, is a happy little girl. Um, so hand appearance to me is a, is a very important indication for surgery as well. It can also help us to use with our assistive devices, um, especially if you've, if you've got lower limb pathology as well. Now, Zancoli, maybe for the, for the pediatricians that's here, if you remember, as a, as a medical student in orthopedics, we love giving names to everything, and we love giving classifications to everything. So now Zancoli, he is probably one of the, the best hand surgeons, or um, was one of the best hand surgeons, and he said his indication for surgery is to have sufficient mental condition and emotional stability, um, low emotional influence on spasticity. So he's got all these things, but... You need to have a good patient and a family support for these children. And I think that's, that's warrant for, for lower limb surgery as well. These children need support and, a, and supportive structures for these things to be, to be better. Now, just our, regarding our outcome of surgery, we know since we've, done, we've been doing SEMLs, um, normally we can correct our deformity immediately. But clinically and st statistically, um, the improvement of gait only happens after 12 months. And we know that your functional Im um, improvements, we sometimes only see them after two years. Um, so I think SEMLs is a, is a thing, so that's why I think for the physiotherapist, I know this physiotherapy it makes your life more difficult, but I think at the end of the day, we make a big difference.
because we know by doing that, 95% of our children will stay stable in the same grade, but there's 5% of them that we can probably make better. But then again, we need to make sure that they've got good support, they've got the correct um, uh, support structures, family, as well as on the medical um, side as well. Now, with any operation, unfortunately, there's complications that can happen. So that's why I want to say is orthopedics is not just the last resort and just jump, dump it onto the orthopedic surgeon. We know that complications of hypothermia is up to 26% of these children. 4.4 um, is hypotension. 20% of them get a bradycardia during the operation. So it's not just going to do a, a little operation on these things. Uh, on our, our more severely affected children and with the older age, we know that the intraoperative and, and post-op complications are dramatically increased with them. They can get fat embolism. They can get bleeding of the wounds, gastrointestinal, cardiorespiratory um, complications. Because I, th I feel cerebral palsy children are always in a, in a catabolic state. So now I'm doing a second um, insult to their body by doing these surgery. And a lot of the times they just really can't cope with them. Even regarding the rehabilitation, it's difficult. 33 of them have myofascial pain. Um, fractures, up to about 4% of these of the, of the um, children can develop fractures. We actually call them physio fractures. And I, I think my wife is also a physio, and I, she knows I call them physio fractures. And um, pressure sores, up to 4% of them. So that's a lot. So think wisely and choose your patients carefully when you want to try to, to operate them. Now, there's a whole list of things that can influence our surgical outcomes. Any child who had an epileptic episode in the last two years, now that is a lot of our cerebral palsy children. So that means that is a negative effect of our outcome of our surgery, and we need to keep that in mind. If they've got known cognitive defects, abnormalities in bone mineralization, my colleagues in, in, in Joburg had a, had a look. All our osteo cerebral palsy children are osteopenic, all of them. So we need to keep these things in, in, in consideration. And I think um, rehabilitation in terms of intensity, quality, and duration is very important. Unfortunately, it happens to me at the government. I operate a child, do wonderful, get the leg straight. Parents don't wear the splints afterwards. And I see the child at three to four months later on, and he's looking exactly the same as he did before the operation. Only thing is now he's got, he's got scars with it. So... Did I do a, a, a favor for the child? Probably not. So, in conclusion, my main aim as an orthopedic surgeon is always to try to optimize the function and to try to prevent the deformity of the child. Now, orthopedic surgery must be part of the long-term management of a, uh, of a person with cerebral palsy. It should be anticipated. It should be planned. It should be discussed. And with more than just the orthopedic surgeon, I feel... Luckily, I do an outreach program from the, from the university side. I go to multiple of the cerebral, cerebral palsy schools. And there, what's so wonderful is there I have the physiotherapist there with me who sees these children two, three times a day. And they can tell me exactly what, what is, can be expected of the surgery as well. Now, in orthopedic surgery, we say, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So what I want to say is, not every cerebral palsy child needs surgery. Choose your, your patients correctly. Um, and so when you look at all these things, remember not all of them will, will, will need this. So orthopedic surgery has the potential to improve function in both the short term and the long term and to try to reduce the burden of the care of the child and also to try to make the child a happier child as well. Thank you very much.